Yes. Winter is coming. <laughs> I think every day I walked outside last winter and I said, thank you for your humidity. <laughs> it just felt good. Oh, wow. And it, even in the winter time here, I mean, we had some, a few cold days last winter, but most of the time, I never put a heavy jacket on either. It just, it doesn't even get that old. That cold. So, yeah, I mean. Every five years, we're going to have a dump. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. that's good. So we're up for it, right? Yeah. We're up yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, I appreciate you, and appreciate you. I, I do uh, want to say thank you for coming all summer here, and uh, we had a good group uh, the entire time. It's hard to believe that 10 Wednesday nights have gone by. Um, sprinkled in there has been 4th of July and the sports camp and VBS, and so it's been, uh, it's been a good summer, and uh, I think there's uh, been some good things done. Tonight we finish up with two chapters, chapters 12 and 13, and so there's uh, a lot to cover, and so as we go through these two chapters, I plan to um, move fairly quickly through both of them so that we can get the information that's uh, here in these chapters. So I think there's some good things here for us to, uh, to stop and consider. So the first uh, part of this is the role of the Holy Spirit. Before we uh, dive into this material here tonight, let's ask the Lord to bless our time together. Father, we just want to thank you for the summer. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we've had uh, to go through uh, this interpretive journey, Lord, and uh, understand the principles behind uh, the interpretation of Scripture. Uh, Lord, I just pray that because of our study time together, that we might all be uh, wiser students of your word, and Father, able to uh, discern uh, better truth from error. And Lord, I just pray that uh, you would just continue to bless uh, each one who's, who's made a point of coming out uh, throughout the summer. So we just want to thank you, Lord, for your many blessings to us and ask that you would guide us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. I am told that most of these are on YouTube, so you should be able to go on YouTube if you miss some of these uh, through the summer. I don't know if there is going to be uh, a second part to this next summer. Probably not. So you have, again, in the book that you purchased, you have the application to particular genres of scripture. So you can take the interpretive journey and you can apply it. Every genre of scripture is going to require a little bit of a different approach. It's not that the interpretive journey is different. It's not that anything that we've been talking about and teaching is different. It's just as you come against different genres, you're going to find different tendencies that you're going to want to be aware of. And so the author of this book has graciously gone through and said, you know, when you come to the book of Revelation, this is what you can expect, and this is a good way to put your tools uh, at, to work. So the same thing is true when you come to an Old Testament section of poetry, whatever it might be. So those sections there are actually the second half of this uh, curriculum that is being taught with China Vision. So China Vision teaches this book in part one and part two. And so both sides of the coin are very important. Uh, whether we're able to get to it or not, I don't know. But uh, you have the material there. And I would encourage you just to go on through and read it. The role of the Holy Spirit, I, I don't even recall who it was. I believe it was someone who was visiting with us one particular Wednesday night this summer. And we were talking about something. And they uh, raised their hand and they said, yes, but the Holy Spirit uh, factors into how we interpret the scripture. And I said, that's right, and we have a chapter towards the end of our, our material here that actually deals with that very subject. And so tonight, uh, we come to the role of the Holy Spirit. He asked the question in the intro, have you ever played a musical instrument? Uh, learning to play an instrument entails taking the time to master the basics, which is tedious. You learn where the notes are, and you repeat the same exercises over and over, and you progress little by little. You eventually think less about the mechanics and begin to experience the wonder and beauty of the musical piece. So the interpretive journey for us, uh, there are certain mechanics that we've talked about. But once those mechanics are in place, what you're going to find yourself doing is pretty much automatic. You're going to look at passages of scripture, and you're going to say, OK, what did this mean back in the, the author's day? And you're going to ask yourself the question, what did the author intend? And you're going to go right on through that 
that whole process without even really thinking too much about it. It becomes really second nature. So that's the beauty of this, and that's the, the good thing. Now, the role of the Spirit in interpreting the Bible goes beyond the mechanical part and really delves into more of the dynamic nature of the relationship. So God gives us his word, and the purpose, I have it underlined here, the purpose in grasping God's word is to teach you how to discover the meaning of the biblical text and apply the meaning to your life. So the second chapter we look at tonight is application. So it is important to know that as we look at the Spirit of God's role in this, we recognize him as the divine author. He is the author. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul is telling us that all Scripture is God-breathed, and sometimes uh, it's inspired and it's, it's, instead of the word God-breathed. But literally, the best translation there you have is God-breathed. So the Bible is God-breathed. In other words, God gave this, and it's profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Spirit of God has breathed the character of God into the Scriptures. Now there is a battle, I would say, within even the walls of Christianity, not something that has not affected us here at Faith Community Church, because it's affected every church. Because there is a thinking that is prevalent in Christianity and becoming more and more prevalent in Christianity, that Scripture is not all sufficient. All right? And 2 Timothy 3 teaches me, when I learned that verse in Awana, okay, it taught me the sufficiency of Scripture. I was clearly taught, and have been clearly teaching ever since, that all a person needs to be everything God intended, that the man of God be perfect, and that doesn't mean without sin, it means complete or mature, in other words, lacking nothing, that the man of God might be lacking nothing. So the word of God equips us so that we're lacking nothing to be able to deal with the myriad of issues that come down the pike to us in this life. So we believe in the sufficiency of scripture. And uh, I, I know uh, Jim Johnson and I have had this discussion uh, recently, um, and we are 110% committed to sufficiency of Scripture. In other words, we're not looking for answers to the world's problems to come through psychology or secular books and secular writing. All right? And that's what's creeping into the church. And that's where, the, that's quite insidious, really, when you stop and you think about it. And it creeps in in the most unusual places, the most unusual ways. But no one ever waves their hand and says, I don't believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. Okay, No one ever does that. What they do instead is introduce secular solutions to spiritual problems and disavow the significance of Scripture. And I look at this and I say, no, the Bible is very clear that this book is so different than everything else that's ever been written. And so I'm going to hold to this word. And I'm going to hold to second. Uh, Timothy 3, and say that I really do believe that the Bible is sufficient, that there's no question that it has everything that we need. So the Greek word there for inspired, uh, the word spirit, pneuma, uh, comes from uh, that inspired, and that's why uh, certain translations are going to mm -hmm. translate 2 Timothy 3 as God breathed, because that's the idea of pneuma. When we think of pneuma, what do we think of? We think of Spirit, actually, the spirit is, is, is oftentimes Holy Spirit, the Duma. Uh, so this is this is that that breath, and so when God breathed into the nostrils of man, and, and He did that, He put His spirit, and that's why we would say we're body, soul, and spirit. Part of that here it is. God just breathed into to man. So again, we have the Spirit of God and the Scriptures going together. That's important for us to understand. So the Spirit is going to work in such a way that you have inspiration, and now that the inspiration of Scripture is completed, we have illumination, which refers basically to the working of the Spirit of God as the Spirit of God takes the Word that is inspired by Him, and He just lights that up for us. 
So the Spirit's work of inspiration and illumination, um, and because of that, we know the Spirit and the Word, they work together, and they're not opposed to each other. So when we're teaching the Word of God, at the end of the day, uh, we're dependent on the role of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is going to take the Word of God as it's given and work in our hearts in a very deep way. He's going to illuminate God's Word so that we understand the impact of what God is intending to speak to us about. Does that make sense? This is so important because if you hear a message and the Bible is not used, tell me what it can accomplish even if it's not heretical. What can it accomplish? Make you feel good. Okay, it makes you feel good. <laughs> exactly, okay? And, and you have a lot of that today, right? We have a lot of that. We have, we have what I call motivational speakers who are now pastors. And you go to church, and you hear a great motivational speech. And it gets you jazzed up for a while, and you walk out, and you know, you're happy to put money in the offering plate because you thought it was really a worthy endeavor. What is the problem? What's the problem? It's not based upon the Bible, and the result of not being based upon the Bible is what? It's shallow. It's not going to have any impact in your life that's lasting, you see. And motivational speech is, is always great. Um, we used to do that. Uh, I played football my freshman year in Bible college. And uh, before every game, you know, the whole football team gathered around, and the captains would get everybody all jazzed up, and they'd start screaming, and, ah, yeah, 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 we're going to go out there and beat them, beat them, beat them, beat them, beat them. We lost every game, <laughs> and the closest game was probably 50 points. Ooh. It was a shellacking from day one to the end. And, you know, you can get as fired up in that huddle as you want to be, and it is not going to change a blooming thing. If you stink, you stink. Okay, that's just the way it is. And, and it's not lasting. We all got revved up, but the reality was very, very different. So that's the difference. And you see that, I see it in Christianity big time. I see it big time. And what we really need is the Word of God, where the Holy Spirit is, is taking those scriptures as they're presented honestly. And the Holy Spirit is able to take the Word and He's able to use it to change who we are, because we're all on a pathway of transformation. None of us should be satisfied where we are spiritually. All of us are interested in the transformational process known as sanctification that we're going through. That's what we're about. Is anybody here satisfied with your spiritual condition today? And if you are, please don't admit it, because we have a long way to go, every single one of us. And so because of that, we need the power of God to transform us. The pep talks, the motivational speeches, really aren't going to do that because you don't have the supernatural interaction with the illumination of the Holy Spirit of God acting upon the inspired word of Scripture. So that is a, a, a huge, huge issue. All right? Next section here in your, your notes, he asks a few questions. I love these questions. Number one is, can we grasp God's word apart from the spirit of the Lord? I mean, can we, can we grasp it? Can we understand it? And he says, yes. If unbelievers who don't have the spirit of God, that's the inference there. Don't miss that, by the way. Okay? If, if you're here tonight and you're a believer, a follower of Christ, you have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. You're sealed until the day, right? And that's, that's wonderful that we have that sealing of the Holy Spirit of God until the day of redemption when we are fully redeemed. If unbelievers use a valid interpretive method, they're able to comprehend a lot of the Bible in the sense of the words, the rules of grammar, the logic of a, pa a passage. People who are able to read literature effectively will certainly be able to detect a contrast or a command or a figure of speech. So there's a general understanding that someone could have by going to the Bible. At the level of cognitive understanding, the spirit play, appears to play a minimal role. I remember taking uh, a Bible class in high school. You say, ah, oh, Pastor Kevin, I thought you went to a public school. I did. I went to one of those liberal public schools on the planet. Okay? I mean, really, really bad. But they had a Bible as lit class. And so I took it. 
boy, boy, was that horrible. Um, <laughs> and again, they tried to understand it from the standpoint of uh, an unbelieving uh, standpoint, and you could comprehend a few things, but you couldn't comprehend much. And where there was value was in, for instance, you could go to the Proverbs and you could pull out, if you do this, you know, then this, and you know, there's certain things there that they could, that they could look at. But as far as missing the intended meaning of the author, yeah, you're pretty much right on, uh, that that's going to happen. The second point is, yes, but only to a degree. Going a step further, can people without the Holy Spirit, unbelievers, understand the meaning of a biblical passage? God bless you. And we would say yes, but only to a degree. We would say that their understanding is limited for at least three reasons. One, sin has an effect on the whole person. That's including our minds, correct? So, so we know that that's true. Um, it's dull our ability to discern scriptural or spiritual truth. Number two, an unbeliever's ability to understand the meaning of a biblical text is limited by the effects of the unbelieving pre-understanding that he or she brings to the text. My teacher in the English literature class in high school was not a believer. He had no clue uh, as, as to anything, and he came with a pre-understanding. What was his pre-understanding? Do you want to guess what it was? That's just it's, a book. it's just a book. Um, it, it's the Bible is literature. Um, why did we study it? Why, why was it in the curriculum at Nassau Regional High School? Because in case someday you got a Jeopardy, you could uh, maybe pull through that category. Um, it was looked at like, that's good. You can broaden your horizon, broaden your understanding by doing this. And literally, that, that was the motivation, uh, you know, just to make yourself more well-rounded, all right? So, you know, they offered uh, everything. And who knows what they offer now? I don't even want to know. Um, Number three, we say that a person without the spirit can understand the meaning of a biblical passage only to a degree because understanding involves more than just taking in information with your mind. Understanding the meaning of a biblical passage involves a whole person, mind, emotion, body. Unbelievers, by definition, do not accept the things of the spirit of God. Now, if you take your Bible, uh, turn with me to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is a pretty, or it should be, I would say, a pretty well-known passage of Scripture for you. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2 is, as a whole, a pretty neat, uh, pretty neat chapter. The Apostle Paul, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back a, a ways here so I can give you the whole picture of what is being talked about here. In verse 5, Paul writes, and he says, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Um, what, is, what is your faith based upon? Is your, is your faith based upon the power of God? In other words, is it based upon the gospel of Jesus Christ, which has transformational power? Or is your faith built upon man's wisdom? We do speak wisdom, yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. We speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it's written, Things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. Ah, okay, that is speaking there in verse 10 of what? The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. What is it? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, but yes, what did the Holy Numa. Spirit do? Numa. Numa, it's inspired. That's inspiration, right? Verse 10, inspiration. The Holy Spirit revealed, and God has revealed them through his Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, 
combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. And the, my Bible version has thoughts in italics, so it's added to make that flow. But understand it this way, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual, it could be spiritual things uh, that you could put in there as well. That which is spiritual with spiritual words. Spiritual with spiritual is what the original text says. Here's verse 14. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. So the natural man, that's a reference to unbelievers. We're all in a state of being a natural man. But you're not natural anymore. And you're supernatural. <laughs> You've been given a new life. You used to be dead in Christ. But now he's made you alive. And because you're now alive in Christ, things are different. Part of what is different for us as believers is that we're able to understand the things that pertain to the Spirit of God. Namely, the inspiration of Scripture and the illumination role of the Holy Spirit that goes along with it. Tremendous combination when you put together the inspiration and the illumination. And you want to see that as something that's very powerful. Problem is, the natural man cannot understand these spiritual things. He looks at the Word of God, and he looks at it as literature, right? It's literature, but it's not God-breathed, it's not transformational, it's not powerful. Think of the book of Hebrews and what it talks about there with regard to the, the Word of God. The Word of God, quick, powerful, sharp with a two-edged sword, and it's piercing down soul and spirit. I mean, it's able to divide all the way. I mean, that is an amazing verse of Scripture speaking about the significant power of of the Word of God. Natural man knows nothing about that. Uh, it doesn't even enter his, his radar screen. At the same time, a person who's in a natural condition yet to be saved can come in contact with the Scripture, and the Scripture can produce a conviction that leads to that transformation. That's the neat part. So you have a power that's in the, in, that the Spirit of God operates on. That's why faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So you want to keep the Word of God out there so that people who are not yet people of faith, people who are in that natural state, will be able to see that, and the Spirit of God will use it. The Spirit of God interacts with the Word of God in a very powerful way. I was thinking of doing a uh, science experiment this today uh, with you, but I couldn't find any potassium at the house. But if you throw some potassium in something, I just remember from high school, um, I know it just kind of goes boom, and uh, it, it's pretty neat, you know, you see this great big uh, reaction, and I thought, you know, that is the word of God, uh, because the spirit of the Lord takes that, and you have an explosion in the hearts and minds of people, that's how powerful the word of God is, and that's why a study like this one, and this whole interpretive journey is, is so wonderful, because we're talking about something that changes people's lives, and we're all living proof of that. And that is the, the wonder of wonders. He says here in verse 14, For they, the natural man, are fool the scripture is foolishness to him. He can't accept the things of God. They're foolishness. He can't understand them because they're spiritually understood or appraised is what New American Standard calls it. But he who is spiritually uh, appraising, he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he will instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So we have the mind of Christ as a believer. Our, our mindset is changed because of our relationship to the Lord. So, go back to your notes there. The question, can we grasp God's word apart from the Spirit? And then you see, yes, and yeah, generally, linguistically you can. Yes, but only to a degree, um, because our minds are darkened what, before our salvation. And then the next one is no. Will people without the Spirit accept the truth of the Bible and apply it to their lives? Absolutely not. And that's what we just got through studying here in 1 Corinthians 2. It's, it's not going to happen. Um, they will reject it um, because it makes absolutely no sense. The Bible says it's foolishness to them. And as such, they, they toss it aside. And yet you see the power of God still continuing on. Isn't it amazing? I mean, uh, that uh, the gospel continues to advance. And it advances in large part because of people like yourselves who are ingesting the word of God and that transformational process is continuing. And because it continues, 
you have an impact in the world in which you live. You are very different than the world. I think it's safe to say the longer we live, the more and more different we're becoming. <laughs> Would you agree with that? Uh, look at society. I mean, look at the way you think. The way you think is messed up, according to most people in society today. The way you think was normally accepted in this country 100 years ago. You, you thought normatively, okay? And people, the way they live, uh, they were the outliers, all right? With all the sinful behavior, I mean, who ever heard of, of some of the sinful behavior uh, that goes on today 100 years ago? I mean, most of the time it wasn't even mentioned because if it was occurring, it was occurring in such small numbers that it was almost non-existent. And, and yet here we are today continuing on uh, to, to basically stand with the truth, nothing that people that were believers 100 years ago were doing. We're no different. Our mindset, we fellowship with them just great today. But the truth of the matter is the world has changed around us. And it's changed because the natural man cannot accept the things that are spiritual, that the Holy Spirit is doing. And that's where the, the rub comes. So looking here at uh, the next section, the spirit and the Christian interpreter, as a believer, what do we expect the Holy Spirit to do for us when we're interpreting the scripture? Um, number one, when it comes to biblical interpretation, the Spirit, having the Holy Spirit, does not mean that the Spirit is all you need. The Spirit does not make valid interpretation automatic. At first, this observation may sound ir irreverent um, or sacrilegious, but that's not the intention. And uh, he gives the illustration of little kids that are learning how to walk, and you know they're, they're kind of going back and forth with their parents a couple feet apart. After playing catch with the child for a few days, the child finally gets the hang of it and begins to walk on their own. For the sake of illustration, what if the child thought, since my parents are here, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to move one foot in front of the other or stumble backward or fall down because mom and dad are close and they'll grab me and take me where I need to go. So when we come to the scripture, we're dependent on the Holy Spirit of God. But we're not saying that because I have the Holy Spirit, I don't have to do any of the work of the interpretive journey. I can just wing it. Um, you, you can't just wing it. Um, so... That brings us to the second point. The Spirit does expect us to use our minds, proper interpretive methods, and good study helps to interpret the Bible accurately. I believe the Holy Spirit is going to help us as we study the Scripture. And I believe that God wants us to know His meaning. So, authorial intent. He wants us to know what He's trying to communicate. The Spirit of God does that. The Spirit of God will help us work through difficult passages. He'll help us to recall things that fit in. He'll help us to, to piece it all together. The, the Holy Spirit is, is going to do that. So it's important to note our role, but then note his role. Second point is the Spirit does not create new meaning or provide new information. And he makes the point of just saying the canon of Scripture is closed. The canon is closed. The measuring, that's that, remember that canon thing we talked about the canon? Those reeds that were there, they used them as measuring sticks. The, the, the measuring tools to determine whether or not a, Bi a Bible, a uh, book of the Bible was to be included in the uh, overall Bible, that was the canon. So the canon is closed. Um, the Spirit of God is not giving new meaning, and we understand that. Again, I go back to 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is going to bring us to the point of spiritual maturity. We don't need any extra revelation from God today to be what God wants us to be. People today are looking for new revelation. In many of the cults, new revelation is ongoing. Um, you know, did you hear that the Mormons found a couple more plates that fell out of the sky? You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's on and on uh, with that. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind. We have everything that we need. And we can rely on the Spirit to help us grasp the meaning of the Word of God. The Spirit does not change the Bible to suit our purposes or match our circumstances. Okay? So He's not going to manipulate things uh, around uh, at all. The Spirit brings the meaning of the Bible to bear on the reader. And uh, this uh, commentator sees three ways in which the Spirit works in the life of the Christian interpreter. One, the Spirit convicts us 
that the Bible is divinely inspired. We come to it, that's our presupposition. Number two, the Spirit works in our minds to impress on us the full meaning of the Scriptures. And three, the Spirit works in our hearts so that we are able to receive the Word of God. And the last way relates closely to what we would understand it to be uh, known as sanctification, where we're becoming more and more like Jesus Christ as we apply the scriptures that the Holy Spirit is speaking to our hearts about. And so when you're going through the Word of God, and I like what he says, do you ever feel, have the feeling as you study the Bible that while you're interpreting the text, the text is also interpreting you? <laughs> Isn't that good? That is really good. Um, he puts it this way, the Spirit's work in interpretation is not to change the sense, i.e. the meaning of the text, but to restore us to our senses. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's, that's, very, that's very good. Uh, it's important, I think, uh, the, the next point that he makes. Being restored to our senses is crucial because our spiritual, of our spiritual maturity. Our spiritual maturity affects our ability to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures. And your level of maturity is going to definitely impact how you go about processing the scriptures. All right? Most Christians who are mature in the Lord are not going to make mistakes that brand new Christians are typically going to make in interpreting uh, the scripture. One of the reasons for that is in our interpretive journey, when we say consult the biblical map, okay, where do you consult the biblical map? Did you go through that? The Bible. Yeah, but it's hard to read the Bible from cover to cover every time, right? Real version, real life version. When we go through that, we, we say, okay, how wide is the river? Um, we're in the New Testament, it's not particularly wide. Um, what's the theological principle? Oh, I see this one, I see this one. Then we say, okay, let's consult the biblical map to make sure our theological principle is sound. Do we get out strong theology and start going through? No, what do we do? Practically. Our remembrance. We draw from experience and our remembrances. Our remembrances of what we've been taught. Right? I mean that's kind of what you do. I mean, so when we think of consulting the biblical map, all of us have different levels of the biblical map. So if you've been saved for two weeks, you're thinking to yourself, hmm, consult the biblical map. I'm going to need some help with this, right? Somebody else who may be sitting there going, well, I've been a student pretty long. I'll pretty much recognize if, if it's off, okay, because of the level of teaching that you've gained over the years. Your, your biblical knowledge, um, as you've been taught, hopefully you've been taught straight, and uh, you've got a, a pretty good knowledge there of your biblical map. So that's, uh, that's important. But the more mature we are in the Lord, it, it's um, going to have a direct bearing on our understanding of Scripture. Direct bearing. Um, and I think all of us would say that we see that over time. You know, we've gone to the Scriptures and things look vastly different, different passages than they did 10 years ago or 20. Isn't that also the work of the Holy Spirit, what, what comes to mind when you're struggling with whether something is consistent with the rest of the Bible? Won't the Spirit equip you with appropriate passages, appropriate memory verses, appropriate songs, whatever it is, to, yeah. to help you do that. Yeah. And I, I see that as very, uh, we're not left to our own devices. Yeah. yeah. The Holy Spirit will, I believe, bring recall uh, for, for something. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, you know, I just knew there wasn't something quite right about that. I remember a preacher preaching. I remember hearing this in church when I was a kid. You know, those types of things that I believe the Spirit of God, good point does do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, the Spirit of God uses prayer and devotional reading to encourage our spiritual growth. Um, Paul's going to, to pray that believers would grow in their understanding and through the work of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit, again, is, is working, working through that. Uh, when you sit down with your Bible, listen to the Lord. With your heart, you're engaging in devotional reading. Every time you have devotions in the morning, you don't think you have to go on the interpretive journey, okay? You, you don't have to do that. There are going to be times when you're going to sit down and you just want to read a few verses of Scripture, maybe meditate on it. Maybe there's a passage you're going to meditate on all week long. Um, you don't have to do the interpretive journey uh, every time you try to do that. In fact, if you do try to do the interpretive journey every time, 
you'll probably get tired of it and you'll put your Bible aside. So you want to be careful. Um, if you're teaching, by all means, you know, take a look at that verse and try to go through those processes. As you come to a passage of scripture, maybe in your devotional reading, you'll say, I really want to know more about what this means. You know, you're reading through daily bread, and uh, the passage is there. You read through the passage, and you're supposed to be on, on Wednesday today, but you never get off of Wednesday for the next two weeks because you're just really smitten by that text, and that passage is so cool, and you're trying to figure it out, and that's when you apply the interpreter journey. You start digging through it and exploring, and that's just the neat stuff that you can do. And, and this will help you to be able to, to pull that apart to determine this is what the author's intention was. And this is the real meaning of this text. So again, Holy Spirit plays an enormous role uh, in our ability to be able to see the Word of God impact us. So you can read it. You can read it. I mean, you can sit down and, and you can you can sit down and you can read and just read and read and read. A lot of, a lot of times... Uh, People will try to read the Bible for a year, okay, and it becomes speed reading for us a lot of times, you know, because we're trying to catch up, we get two, three days behind, and then we're trying to really push it, and it doesn't even, it, it doesn't even affect us devotionally a lot of times, because we're just trying to, you know, get through that. I remember being in seminary and having to read, you know, copious amounts of stuff, and I mean, it wasn't unusual to read thousands of pages per semester. And you're reading through some really heavy, heavy stuff. And it gets to the point where it's like, you're just, your brain's kind of turned off, but your eyes are still going. <laughs> and, uh, and so you don't get the benefit of it. So as you go about your own study, remember that we're not saying that the interpretive journey has to be applied every morning when you get up with your cup of coffee in your, in your Bible passage. Look, I speak to your heart and, uh, and go from there. Just don't get off on some tangent that is a, a wrong interpretation and start living life in a different direction because you just happen to read something that sent you in a, an orbit. Okay. All right. Now we are application chapter 13. Chapter 13. He starts off the application part and he says, while studying the Holy Lands, a seminary professor of mine met a man who claimed to have memorized uh, the Old Testament in Hebrew. I remember when Karen and I were there, my memory's not as good, but I know that we had, um, for a day or two, uh, a Jewish fellow who took us around and showed us some of the sites. And he was brilliant. He knew all of the, the things, you know, and you know, archaeology-wise and different things. And he was very good. But he was, um, he was a Jew who didn't believe in Jesus Christ. And he's going through and he's teaching you and you're sitting there going, what, how in the world can you be this knowledgeable and not be a believer? And this is what he's saying here. Uh, this fellow's giving the illustration um, where a seminary professor then meets this man who memorized the Old Testament in Hebrew. And he was astonished um, by the man's ability to be able to do this. But the amazing thing, for two hours, he says, the man continued word for word without a mistake as the professor sat in stunned silence uh, because even though he knew all of this, he was an atheist. Here was someone who knew the scriptures better than most, and yet he didn't even believe in God. This man certainly knew the Bible in Hebrew, no less, but he did not really grasp God's word. When we grasp God, God's word, we're not only understanding its meaning, but we're ready to take the final step and apply it to our lives. We can't apply the Bible without knowing what it means, but we can know the Bible without applying it. Uh, James chapter 1 uh, tells us that it's very, very possible to be familiar with the scripture and not, not let it change our law, our lives. He's, um, in James chapter 1, this is what he says. He says, but prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Is any one of us here not guilty of hearing the word and not being a doer of it? That's a huge problem for us, isn't it? We would all admit that. We, we're all guilty of that. But he says, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror 
For once he's looked at himself and gone away, he's immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, this is the word of God he's, he's mentioning here in verse 25, saying, you look into the word of God and you abide by what the word of God says, you have not become a forgetful hearer, but you're an effectual doer, this man will be blessed. So there's the contrast. Very, very easy. When we're talking about application, it is very simple for us, very uh, easy for us not to make the applications, not to make the applications for our own personal life. We can go through all the journey and, and, never, and never make application. Let me just say, if you're a teacher or a preacher for that matter, um, application is part of what you're trying to do. You, you always want to bring out application. And uh, I remember uh, an assistant pastor some years ago, he preached the message and he said, uh, you know, he asked me, Kevin, he said, you know, would you listen to the message and tell me what you think? And I remember sitting down with him after I listened to it. I said, it was a good message. Everything he said was absolutely true, but there was no application. There was no application whatsoever. And some people would say, well, let the Holy Spirit be the applicator. And there is definitely the role of the Holy Spirit convicting us of sin when we come face to face with the scripture. But oftentimes we need to see how the theological principle applies to us. It is, it's, it's, like, it's like taking a golf swing and just going half wet, okay? You, you've got to follow through with it because it's, it's the whole package. It's the, the whole deal. And the application process, as we'll see here, is, is very, very significant um, as, as we look at this. Now, he has in here meaning and application, uh, and he talks about uh, the text meaning is tied to the author. We've gone through this. Um, we use the term, he says, application to refer to the response of the reader to the meaning of the inspired text. Application reflects the specific life situation of the reader, and it will vary from Christian to Christian. So, what does this passage mean, and how do I apply this meaning to my life, rather than what does this passage mean to me? The distinction being between meaning and application is a very important one. Okay, So how do we apply meaning? It's a great question. Application can vary greatly from reader to reader, and I just want to say greatly, but it can, it can vary. The application part of it, however, there are certain principles that we need to observe in order to do it correctly. All right. So people, sometimes you can apply things. If, if, and the danger is this. The danger is, uh, I'm going to, here's the danger. You're a pastor, and uh, you just heard this week that so-and-so and so-and-so were gossiping in church. All right, they were gossiping. It, it was a terrible problem. And, and you decided you've got to do something about it. So you're going to stand up on Sunday morning. You're going to preach a message about gossip. You've got your application already all lined up. You knew, know what you're going to say. You can't wait to get to the application part, right? And it really doesn't matter what passage that you go to because the application is going to be this, all right? So the application drives the message, right? It's a, it's a very dangerous way to go about doing that, and yet I've seen it done, okay? I remember being in a church one time, and I was in trouble because they only used the King James Bible there, and I had a New American Standard. And it became known by the pastor and I was visiting back from college, and he preached a whole message about why that was a bad Bible verse. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking to myself, man, I'm the only guy here. Now, he had the application. He knew where the application was going. It was like a big, you know, like an eight millimeter gun. I mean, it was just whoosh. And, uh, and I don't remember any of the passages, but I remember the application, all right? Because that, that was a hard hitting application. You want to be able, as you're teaching, and preaching, you need to be patient. 
and allow, if you're doing a teaching of the whole counsel of God, which is what we're supposed to be doing, every subject is going to come up as, as long as it's a biblical subject, and I don't see the Bible version as being a biblical subject, but the, the, you know, as you go through, you will see um, everything covered over time. You go through different books of the scripture, and different topics come up. And people come up to me and say, well, Pastor, you know, why don't you preach on giving more money? You know, we need some messages on, on giving. And I would much rather just wait for that topic to come up within a book of scripture that we're going through. Because then you can address it fairly. Now, there are times, I will agree, there are times when a stewardship series is needed. And you might preach on serving. Um, and I, I, I do this sometimes, maybe not so much once a year, but once every couple of years, where here it is, we're talking about stewardship of finances, stewardship of time, and so forth. And those are topical messages. But it's better to be able to go through the text and to fairly handle the text. And I've told you before that oftentimes when I go through the topical, I usually will find a text that is fairly uh, representing the topic. In other words, I'm not pulling this out of my hat. This is the passage we're gonna look at. And so to me, when I do a topical message, well, it, it, Christmas is a great example, right? You're gonna preach on the birth of Christ. Where are you gonna go? Well, let's go to Luke chapter two. Um, I'm not gonna try to preach from you know, a minor prophet on that. I'm just going to go to the passage. So if it's something like uh, giving your time to the Lord, I may go to Philippians and talk about reading your time. So you, you, but you're staying within the lines because you're handling that scripture properly. And you want to do that every time you're teaching uh, as well. So when you offer a teaching, uh, making sure that uh, it's, it's biblically based is huge. We have to abide by the interpretive journey so that the last thing, the frosting on the cake, is this application. If we come out of line, we will not be point on this application. We'll end up, we'll end up bringing thoughts in that are not related to that passage, okay? And that's what we are going to try to avoid. Notice here, Philippians chapter four, this is the illustration. So as we go through this, here are these steps. How do we find meaning? Step one. Grasp the text in their town. In light of the historical cultural context, summarize what you've discovered about the original situation. So Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse 13. What does 413 say? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right? What about Paul's background? When does he write that? Where is he when he writes that? He's in prison. That's right. He's awaiting trial. And he's talking here about the faithfulness that he has to Christ um, and how that has landed him in prison. It's a friendship letter, and he's exhorting the Philippians to stand firm in the face of their suffering, in the face of the opposition that they're up against. So Philippians 4, 10 through 13, that's the literary context, by the way, Philippians 4, 10 through 13. Paul acknowledges their monetary gift sent through their mutual friend, Epaphroditus. He wants to make it clear he's most grateful for their gift. So as a part of this step, if you were to get to that point of doing the application, you might want to write out a statement of what the text meant for the biblical audience. Step two, measure the width of the river to cross. What are some of the differences that we have today uh, between Paul's audience for, in particular, Philippians 4.13? What are the major differences? You've never been in jail for your faith. All right. We're not under the same persecution. We're not dealing with the same persecution. Um, so there's huge differences there. Um, but what do you see as some similarities? Under the same covenant. We are under, under the covenant of grace. Um, he says here, we're also members of Christ's body, the church. Um, and frankly, Many of us experience difficult situations as we seek to live out our faith, right? For the most part, the river of differences for Philippians 4.13 is not that wide. And I agree with that. Step three, cross the principalizing bridge. We're going to look for those theological principles. Um, when you identify the theological principles, you're discerning 
what is timeless in the passage. So we're looking for theological principles that applied in Paul's day that also apply to us today. Philippians 4.13. You could say, believers can learn to be content of a variety of circumstances through Christ who gives them strength. Or you might say, Christ will give believers strength to be content in a variety of trying circumstances that come <coughs> as a result of following him faithfully. Right? So we could go there with the principalizing bridge. Step four, grasp the text in our town. We're going to look carefully how the biblical principle addresses the historical cultural situation. And what you're seeing here are key elements that are present in the intersection of text and situation. As the principle in 413 intersects with the historical cultural situation, there are some elements, and you have them um, listed there. Element one is a Christian, Paul, a Christian who's experiencing a variety of trying circumstances as a result of following Christ faithfully. Number three, Christ will give the Christian strength to endure whatever the circumstances are. With the key elements in hand, we're ready to connect our world and make the application. He is going to give to us here now uh, some advice for application. And he says, discover a parallel situation in a contemporary context and use that as an application. So we have Paul in prison writing and he's going through a very difficult time. Can we pull an application that is relevant to our day that has those elements that I mentioned all part of it? Okay, that is a good question. We've got three examples. Example one, Philippians 4.13, it's a popular theme verse for Christian athletes in American society. Verse was even prominently displayed on the robe of a recent championship boxer. The phrase, I can do everything. No doubt motivated this boxer to defeat his opponent. You remember Tim Tebow, he used to write, you know, he had Philippians 4.13 sometimes down under his eyes, right? Um, I can do all things. Assuming that Paul and the boxer are both Christians, <laughs> that's element one, right? Because when we first, the first element was, we're talking Christians here. So we're going to assume that Paul and the boxer both are, are Christians, and they're both looking for Christ for strength. We're still missing at least one key element of the intersection between the original situation and the context. We're missing the fact that this is a Christian who's experiencing a variety of trying circumstances as a result of being a follower of Christ. That's not there with regard to the boxer. So when the boxer says, I can do everything, we look at that literary context, and it shows us that the everything refers to, in Paul's context, a variety of trying circumstances. While at this point in his life, Paul's experiencing the trial of need versus plenty. Paul says that I can do everything in Christ, he's referring to being content. There's a big difference between the trials of athletic competition and the trial of being in prison for your faith, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. So we misapply the Bible when we grab a situation that is not a genuine parallel. There might be superficial connection, but one or more of the key elements is missing. Ultimately, when we misapply the Bible, we hurt people by pointing them toward false realities. So it's not something that is without an expense. It's costly to do this. By misapplying the passage, and we've gone through, say you go through the whole process, and you come to those things, you're gonna look for those elements. If you misapply it, it can hurt people. It can really hurt people. I, I gave uh, Brian the illustration before class. You know, you, I went to this faith healer meeting many years ago, and they said, God told this man backstage before he came out that if the audience would give God their best, God would give them his best, meaning finances, over the next year. And he said, this is what God told me your best is. Take your wallet out, the biggest bill you have in your wallet, hand, raise it up. That's what your best is. And God's best is he'll bless you tremendously financially through this next year. If you don't have any money in your wallet, you brought your checkbook. If you brought your checkbook, the highest of the last three checks you've written, that's your best. 
write out that check right now and raise it up. And let's give God a wave offering. I love that wave offering. I left after that. <laughs> Man, this is ridiculous. Okay, but here's where the harm comes. Okay, I give God as if that part is not harmful enough. <laughs> right. I give God my best because this man heard from God, and I have financial disaster that year. Who does that person who has financial disaster blame? Yeah, he doesn't blame the guy who's the charlatan, the false teacher. He blames God. And that's why this becomes very expensive to misapply the truth. All right? So, again, you're looking for elements in this. There's a lot of great application from this passage in Philippians. Would you agree? There's a lot of great application. If you're teaching kids or adults, I mean, this is, this is wonderful as you're going through difficulty. But the example number one is terrible. Terrible. Look at the example number two. You get better here. <laughs> You're a Christian student experiencing financial difficulty. Anybody here a Christian student in the past who was experiencing financial difficulty? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Those were great days. They were character building days. I, I, I mean to tell you, I couldn't afford the merits when I was in Bible college. Uh, I, I really couldn't. Um, it, it was terrible. And I remember my sister. Not that I'm bitter still, but maybe I am. Um, <laughs> She came, I, I was in school my first year, she came my second year, freshman year, and uh, I had a 1965 Grand Prix, if you've ever seen one of those. I actually passed on Sunday morning coming to church a 65 Bonneville, and I just had to think back, you know. Um, I mean, they're almost the same, those two uh, Pontiacs. But she drove my Pontiac uh, down and uh, parked it wherever she wanted to park it when she came back. And they were very particular at Bible College where you parked your car. And you know who that car was registered to, don't you? Me. So she parked it wherever she wanted, and I would get her demerits. And there was, and you know what? Demerits didn't bother me at all because I never was bad enough to ever get in trouble. You had 100 demerits until you got campus, and 150 until they kicked you out. And I never got close to the 100 until my senior year when I was playing Risk in the basement. But uh, <laughs> that's a whole other story. But, but I never, I mean, on my first semester, I got, or my first year, I got two demerits. That's, that's all I ever got. And my sister showed up the next semester, and I'm getting these things back, 10. And I'm getting 10 demerits, and it was a $10 fine. Oh, with it. I was making $1.95 an hour working at the time. So it cost me five hours worth of work to pay that fine. And she never paid me back a dollar. No. <laughs> the, point, the point is, when you're in school, and you're trying to get through school, you know, I can relate to that. And maybe you're here today, and you're having financial difficulties. This is what he says in the example. You had all your needs met when you lived at home, but circumstances changed when you answered God's call to prepare for ministry. Because of your parents' financial situation, you had to pay for your own education. That, that was my situation. You're struggling to make ends meet. The long hours of work turn into late nights, drowsy mornings in class. Uh, you believe God has called you to academic preparation, but you find yourself in a tough situation. You're tired most of the time. I used to bring my briefcase to school, and we'd sit in the auditorium, and I'd flip open my briefcase and put my head down, and I would just <laughs> go on, you know. And uh, I, I don't know, but they caught me every time just about. And I'd get called in, and they'd ask me, well, what's going on? And I'd explain my schedule to them, and they would just pat me on the head and let me leave. Um, <laughs> But he said, in spite of it all, you're trusting Christ for strength to hang in there. So you see, that's, that's a, a, a good, modern, realistic application, right? And it comes because it matches up those elements that we talked about. Yes, you have a Christian. Number two, they're going through some difficult circumstances as a result of following Christ, because Christ had led them to that school. And three, here's the good news. Christ will give that Christian strength to endure it. Example three, you're a single mom whose non-Christian husband recently deserted you because of your commitment to Christ. Two small children suddenly find themselves without a father. A sense of personal failure weighs heavy. Social pressure of what people will say lingers. You face overwhelming financial burdens and worry about how you'll survive on your part-time job. As life seems to crumble around you, God has given you an unshakable peace that Jesus Christ is with you, that he understands, and that he will see you through. The last two scenarios, all the key elements are present, as we mentioned. And he goes on, he says, make your application specific. Once you've identified a parallel situation, genuine parallel, you should give some thought to specific ways that the uh, biblical principles might apply. So 
what should the student and the single mother think or do as they turn to Christ for strength? Uh, what we think or do is important because applications can touch on ways of thinking, right? As well as acting out or behaving. If we never make our application specific, people might not know specifically how to live out the message of the Bible. So don't be afraid to make specific suggestions. That's where the application really is helpful. It really is helpful. If I preach a message and I never make an application, it, it, it's, it's, you're not following through. You want to be able to give people something to think about. Now, as you make an application, the application, ironically, will not hit every person. It just, it just won't. You make an application that has those key elements in it, and it might generally deal with someone, but maybe there's someone who has a really specific need. And you might give two illustrations, one of a person in Bible college and another who's a single mom, and you're neither. All right, you're neither. So the application doesn't, but the Holy Spirit of God will intervene. And the Holy Spirit speaks to people about different things that I know preaching, I never see coming, okay? But that's the role of the Holy Spirit, and it's, it's neat to, to see that. So he's saying here, Make some real-world scenarios. Example number one. As a student, you might gain encouragement and strength from a conversation with a pastor or a professor who knows the trials and rewards of preparing for ministry. Christ often works through his people to provide strength, and you could use a good conversation or two with someone who's been there. Ask them specifically about ways to manage your time and options for financing your education. They may suggest other people to consult. You could do that. This is the application part. So you come to the end, and, and let's say you're, you're talking to a room full of college students, and you know the majority of them are financially struggling. You could, after preaching or teaching on Philippians 4, you could bring to bear an application that's like this. I know a lot of you are going through this. Let me just encourage you. you know, seek out a pastor or someone who's already walked this journey. And, and spend time with them and see how God brought them through it, how God provided. Hear stories of how God's provided. Maybe in your application, this is what I would do, I would love to take um, and use an example of someone who God provided for. Because there's nothing new under the sun. If you're walking in difficulty, understand that there's been someone who's been trusting Christ who's walked it before you. And there's a testimony of how God delivered that person through that difficulty. And you might need to hear that testimony. So that's what I would do if I was teaching on that passage. I would look for a real-world scenario where I can share a testimony of someone who walked through that journey and saw the light on the other end of the tunnel and was encouraged. Maybe you can do that from a personal experience. A lot of times we use personal experiences when we're teaching or preaching. And we can say, well, this happened to me, and I know exactly what that's like, and it's just amazing how God provided. And that's awesome, right? I mean, that's just... Fantastic if you uh, if you can do that. Um, just in closing, there take the time uh, to read the section uh, from Philip Yancey's book, "What's So Amazing About Grace," because it's a, a modern day takeoff from the prodigal son, and it's an illustration, and it's it's not um, it, it's just really neat how this girl, and she's in rough shape and treated terribly and so forth, and then she comes back home and um, there's a wonderful reuniting and it's just a, a neat um, real life modern scenario that he says this is very powerful and it is very good and it's very helpful. So just take your, your time on your own, read through that, it'll be, it'll be worth the, uh, the time you spend uh, doing that. So his conclusion here uh, as he looks at the application, um, he says, we remind you as faithful readers, our job is not to invent new meaning, but to apply it. And you'll be able to find a number of parallel situations in your life or in the world that do contain all the key elements. And when you find a genuine parallel, you can be confident that you're applying the real meaning. So remember, we study scripture not just to learn more about God, but to know and love God more. So huge, um, uh, just a huge point uh, for us you know, to, to remember, okay? So hopefully that's been helpful to you uh, as you think about the application um, aspect. Again, we don't have license to just go and apply 
in any way we want to apply it. There are some key elements, we want to stick to those so that our application is pretty funneled and, and pretty direct. Okay. Any questions, comments? Thank you. I'm pretty surprised that we could actually get through those two chapters. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. I have to tell you, though, I, it was pretty fun. Are you going to turn that off? Do you want me to turn it off? <laughs> <laughs>